It's time for Americans to scale up what we know about making human connections and repositioning ourselves for a dramatically different new future. We have never done our very best with using soft power. It's time to ask, why haven't we? What I'd also ask is, what do we have to lose? Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Mary Eintema, president of World Boston, and it's wonderful to welcome you to the fifth annual State of the State Department program with Deputy Assistant Secretary Stacy White and Farah Pandit once again in the Boston Public Library and also on Zoom. Thank you, as always, to the Lowell Institute, which generously supports the State of the State Department program. And thank you to our production partners at GBH Forum Network. Thanks also to the beautiful Boston Public Library, which I love to tell visitors is the first public library in the US. I also want to shout out um, Ambassador Nicholas Burns, who is in Beijing. Five years ago, he thought this was a good idea to support our community's understanding of diplomacy. And he helped us get this series off the ground and run it. So in absentia, thank you, Ambassador Burns. Emphatically, a big thank you to Global Engagement Manager, Natalie Mace, and the whole World Boston staff and board for all you do. A few reminders, of course, World Boston's mission. Uh, which is to foster engagement in international affairs and global cooperation. Our programs keep morphing from in-person to virtual to hybrid to who knows what next, but this mission persists with you as part of it. Please learn more at worldboston.org and if you can, support our work financially. Uh, exchange is a powerful catalyst for international engagement. You meet someone from far away, you travel somewhere and poof, your worldview has changed. Usually you want to learn more. And here we are at World Boston. And we people who are involved with exchanges are just one part of a massive and growing pursuit, public diplomacy, which spans both official and citizen engagement. Historically, Americans love public diplomacy. We love hospitality and sharing best practices. But in case you haven't noticed, some things have changed in the past few years. Even before the pandemic, public diplomacy was facing challenges and opportunities from uh, new platforms to the rise of non-state actors, both good and bad, and deep existential questions, for example, about outcomes and cost and about authenticity, most important part, in the midst of social and economic upheaval at home. At the same time, many, including our president, feel that America faces an urgent need to promote democracy, particularly given the war in Ukraine and the rise of authoritarianism globally. So what is the mission of public diplomacy and how do we deliver on that? Fortunately, we have with us now a true dream team to help us sort out these existential questions. We are truly honored that they have traveled to be with us. Stacy White and Farah Pandit each have a wealth of experience with the U.S. Department of State, diplomacy, and public diplomacy. I won't go over every detail of their rich backgrounds, but here are the highlights. Stacy White joined the State Department's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, uh, or ECA, as the Deputy of, uh, Assistant Secretary, or DAS, if you want to be very Washington, uh, for professional and cultural exchanges in that role. Das White oversees a broad array of professional youth cultural sports and tech exchange programs, including those supported by the offices of international visitors and citizen exchanges, which as you may know, World Boston very proudly implements in this region. Since 1988, Stacy White has served as an American diplomat in US embassies in Canada, Mexico, Finland, Panama, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Most recently, she was Minister Counselor for Public Affairs in Ottawa, Canada. In Washington, uh, Stacy has served in the Bureau of the Western Hemisphere and in the Foreign Service Institute. Uh, she, previously, uh, she also represented the State Department at the Atlantic Council in 2005. She previously served as Director of the Office of International Visitors and the Chief of Cultural Programs in the Office of Citizen Exchanges. Before the Foreign Service, 
Stacy White was an award-winning journalist in Texas and Oklahoma. Welcome, Stacy. Farah Pandit, if I may, welcome back to Boston. Um, Farah is an author, foreign policy strategist, and former diplomat, and my friends, a former Will Boston board member, a world-leading expert in, and pioneer in countering vi violent extremism. She is a frequent media commentator and public speaker. Her book is How We Win, How Cutting Age Entrepreneurs, Political Visionaries, Enlightened Business Leaders, and Social Media Mavens Can Defeat the Extremist Threat. She was a political appointee under Presidents George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama, and most recently was the first ever special representative to Muslim communities, serving both Secretaries Clinton and Kerry. She has served in senior roles on the National Security Council, at the State Department, and at the U.S. Agency for International Development. She also served on the Department of Homeland Security's Advisory Council, chairing its task force on countering violent extremism. She's a senior fellow with the Future of Diplomacy Project at the Belfer Center at Harvard Kennedy School, as well as an adjunct senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. And this is cool. In the fall of 2020, the Muhammad Ali Center named Farah Pandit the first ever Muhammad Ali Global Peace Laureate for her track record of and commitment to promoting diversity, cohesion, and respect. Stacy and Farah, we're so honored that you have come here for this conversation. Stacy, I'll turn to you first for some remarks and then to Farah. So thank you, Mary, and thank you, Farah. It is a great honor to be here. And in fact, I'm thrilled to be here at the Boston Library and to have a chance to join such distinguished company in talking about something very close to my heart. Um, in fact, it's been a very exciting week for me um, because I've had the privilege of participating in a range of programs and activities that really encompass the sort of broad array of activities and programs that comprise public diplomacy for the Department of State. So um, as Mary said, I'm Stacy White. And if you wanna do the math, I have been a career foreign service officer for 34 years. And I have served in large embassies, small, medium, in some very interesting and challenging parts of the world and in some parts of the world where we have very close and important relationships because of their proximity to the United States and all the different ways that our societies are connected. Um, so I know that we have people in the audience and online that have a broad range of experience and maybe even some newcomers to international diplomacy. So I'm going to start off just a second with the basics, which is what is public diplomacy? Well, I think all of you are familiar with traditional diplomacy, which takes place mostly in government buildings between government officials, sometimes on bilateral country to country relationships often in international fora such as the United Nations. But to sum it up, public diplomacy, very simply put, is the kind of diplomacy that takes place between people. It's building relationships between US citizens and citizens of other countries. It takes place in cities, schools and universities, cultural stages, sports arenas, radios, networks, commercial enterprises, and local communities. So this in turn helps US prosperity and national security through promoting American values and connections with Americans and connecting people across borders to address challenges that frankly cross borders. There's just nothing that you can really point to in today's world that doesn't require more than one nation's attention to really get a chance to, to work deeply on important issues. And it means that we need to help foreign audiences to understand current issues within the United States, what our country stands for, what our policies are, and in fact, sometimes this is the most helpful of all, the context for these policies. So the State Department has many ways of putting public diplomacy into practice. I can speak most in depth to what I know best, which is the Bureau of Education and Cultural's programs and activities, which do focus on the kind of citizen diplomacy that's conducted right here in Boston. I can tell you that, you know, as a diplomat, I always speak so proudly of this because we're, we're really unique in the world and how we go about this. It is a partnership with our own people, with American society. It's not a government program. 
nothing that we do is really strictly from the State Department. Everything is done with grants, cooperative agreements, partnerships with organizations such as World Affairs, Boston, universities, all the different range of community organizations, states, civic organizations that cross the country. And that's truly a strength of ours, I, I think. Um, earlier this week, Secretary Blinken spoke to a group of our exchange participants who had just come back from a year in Germany. And as you can imagine, what a year it's been. Um, these were 350 youth, uh, some of them high school students, some of them vocational students, some of them staffers at uh, Congress or the Bundestag. So 350 had come back from their year abroad and they had amazing stories to tell, not only of what it meant to them to live in another nation, learn another language, speak it on a daily basis, live in people's houses, but of course they, like all the other Americans that were abroad this past year, have been caught up in the situation in Ukraine and spent a good deal of their time also helping Ukrainian refugees and really experiencing at a very personal and visceral level what it means when the international order is not acting the way it ought to, and when peaceful relations have not continued the way they ought to, and when people's lives are threatened and people's rights are being taken away. So they came back with a very deep perspective, and they in turn will go back to all of their communities across the country and explain to their families and their cities and their schools what their experience was and their perspectives. As, as we like to say, these programs are life transforming events. You don't know exactly where the transformation will come, but it's certainly there. Secretary Blinken knows this and he appreciates it. Um, he said when he spoke to the students that he considers uh, one of the most important investments of the State Department to be exchanges. And he said, and you know, when you think about education, culture, and sports programs in particular, these are probably the largest return on investment programs we do because, uh, you know, we actually spend a pretty small percentage of the national foreign affairs budget on this sort of thing. And yet the impact is huge. It, it really does build the kind of lasting connecting people tissue networks that we need to tackle the problems of today and the problems of tomorrow. So he said to them that over time, the ties of friendship that you have made and understanding between people turn into bonds of trust between countries. And that's how exchange programs serve our mission of building peaceful collaborative relationships with our allies and partners around the world. And yesterday I got to be in Capital One to the jealousy of my son, who's a huge basketball plan, fan. And when we had a large event recognizing the 10th anniversary of our Global Sports Women's Mentoring Program, which is um, a small program with huge impact that the State Department does around the world. We partner with the University of Tennessee for this and with ESPN W and the First Lady of the United States came and spoke at this event. She talked with 10 of the most prominent, I guess you'd say, former exchange participants from this program. These are women who traveled to the United States and were mentored over the last 10 years, and they're now parliamentarians radio broadcasters, television broadcasters, uh, journalists, and uh, leading NGOs and women's rights organizations, empowerment, uh, racial equity groups in Brazil, India, Pakistan, Egypt, Bulgaria, you name it. And, you know, really they got their start in leadership and in sort of developing these connections through these kinds of programs. So I just want to give you that as a small example of how one discrete program can, can just have incredible impact. For this and other exchanges, we bring these US citizens abroad and citizens from other countries here for all sorts of engagements. You, I know, have heard of the Fulbright program, which is one of our longest serving programs. And just to give you another example of how profoundly important Fulbright and Humphrey is, we've all been going through the COVID-19 pandemic 
And um, we have this network of scientists and innovators around the world who recognize the threat of disinformation, especially in the public health sector, and organize themselves to make sure they were putting out correct information in their countries and sharing it abroad and such. So there have been some incredible stories. I mean, in Malawi, for example, uh, one of the uh, Humphrey Fellows created an app that brought directly to the Malawian people before too much was known what the World Health Organization had to say about the pandemic. And America's CDC and their own um, government of Malawi uh, health plan things. And now something like a million people tune into his app all the time. And it's kind of spread across Africa. Africa as well, of course, to get this kind of real life information that came about through this. You know, public diplomacy has a long history. Uh, some of you in this room may recognize the name of Rick Ruth, who has been a real uh, uh, crusader, if you will, for public diplomacy across his career. He's retired now, but he probably started in the early days as an exhibitor in going to the Soviet Union and talking about the American way of life when we were trying to have a more peaceful time. And when he talks about how we got into this business of public diplomacy, he says that and reminds us all that exchanges are born out of conflict, out of need, out of persecution, out of discord, out of trouble of all kinds, and very importantly, out of the resolve of tough-minded men and women of goodwill to do something about that. So it really started taking off at the end of World War II when we started to use these efforts to engage regular American citizens, whether they were jazz ambassadors or exhibits abroad of an American kitchen, you know, it really wasn't about the kitchen. It was about the young Americans who spoke Russian, who would be able to take questions about life in America. And people would queue up around the blocks in the most freezing of weather to, to ask things that were on their mind that they just hadn't known about before. And, you know, something like that is happening all around the world still today. We have something like 600 what we call American spaces. And these are libraries, cultural centers, sort of technology places, sometimes even just a shelf in a university that has books about America or actually some sort of technology that connects back where we engage with local people and populations about a variety of topics to make sure that we're still connecting and connected. Right now, the Department of State is going through a public diplomacy modernization effort to adapt what we're doing to current times. The United States needs to keep its competitive edge and leadership, and we're focused on learning what issues matter to communities around the globe and how we can amplify voices to promote democratic values, such as human rights and the ability of people to participate in their own futures in government and anti-corruption. So we're making sure that our staff has the right set of skills, that they develop new skills, such as creative content generation, audience analysis, and strategic planning. Equipping our staff with new knowledge is what we consider to be the key. So we're really upping people's ability to do audience analysis, data analysis, message testing, and we're ensuring that our public diplomacy programs embed diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility across our work. This is to help foreign audiences to understand current issues within the United States, but it's also a means of for us to stay engaged at basically every level. You know, one of our strong points as a society is our diversity. It's a diverse world out there. We need to have diverse representation inside the State Department, as I'm sure uh, Ambassador Abercrombie Wynne Stanley probably talked about when she spoke to you, because that strengthens our own competitiveness. And when we're talking about America's global advantage, we're really talking about what the rest of the world wants from us, that if we're not the only ones that can bring it, we certainly are one of the more popular sources for it. And I'm talking about education, higher education, English language, and entrepreneurship. 
So a lot of our efforts abroad focus on these, these three things. We want to provide platforms, if you will, for communities to have uh, an opportunity to engage with us, uh, to develop their own critical thinking and media literacy skills to help make communities more resilient against disinformation and other threats that are out there. And these are sort of a rising importance in our foreign affairs agenda and very much reflected in the programs that we do. So we not only need to remain relevant, but we also must evolve to continue US leadership in public diplomacy. I'm proud to represent the United States and the US Department of State in these efforts because I know how much of an impact these programs have on peace, prosperity, and well being of the United States. And I hope that all of you will help us spread the word about our programs and their impact so that we can continue to benefit the American people. And I look forward to discussing more about this in our conversation tonight. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Now we're gonna have a few remarks from Farah. Okay. Well, good evening to everybody. Uh, I would like to thank World Boston for inviting me home to Massachusetts. It's a joy to be here, especially in this glorious Boston Public Library. Uh, I love libraries. Uh, I somehow feel you feel smarter just being here. Ironically, you also feel smaller. You see wisdom in books that you have not read you open pages that make you ponder. You imagine new things that you think about and how much more there is to do in this world. And unfortunately, there's a great deal to do. A world today is unrecognizable. The last few years have brought to light devastating realities, whether through the aftermath of the 2016 election, the rise of misinformation, conspiracy theories, lies, the climate crisis, the death of Floyd, or the devastation of the pandemic and much more. It's exposed what I call societal sinkholes on the American and the global landscape. The us versus them narratives are rampant, funded and organized. The lack of trust is high. Humans are tired. In such an environment, the ability to make positive change is limited. It's been overwhelming and our reality is dangerous. In 2022, America is discussing, if you can believe it, the fragility of democracy. In 2022, America is confronting unprecedented rises of hate and extremism. The FBI reported last year that hate crimes have reached the highest level in more than a decade. Nearly two of every three hate crimes reported last year, 64% were motivated by a bias against race, ethnicity, or ancestry. In a recent conversation with Holster, who focuses on Gen Z, I was, told, I was told that when he asked respondents, what unifies America? Their answer was fear. Globally, the landscape is also grim. Whether Russia's attack on the Ukraine, the rise of authoritarianism in several regions of the globe, as you heard from Stacy, or the challenges faced, faced by climate changes, policies are being tested. What do we do? Today, we're gonna to have a conversation about one of the tools in our toolkit, the power of soft power, the power to influence the way we think about each other and create innovative solutions for common goals together. In the years following 9-11, I was tasked with finding new ways to build bridges, open connections, and find common purpose with communities of Muslims all over the world. I know the work of our diplomats at the US Department of State and the critical importance of soft power. Public diplomacy is one part of the power and it is vital. Yet funding, resources, and attention is often put on other elements of power. 
hard power while critical. Of course, it's critical. It can't be the only tool that we use to build stronger and more resilient communities around the world. I'm gonna be brief today because Stacy gave us an overview of what PD is all about. And I look forward to the conversation today about why soft power is so important and what I've learned about its value and its magical powers. It's time for Americans to scale up what we know about making human connections and repositioning ourselves for a dramatically different new future. We have never done our very best with using soft power. It's time to ask, why haven't we? What I'd also ask is, what do we have to lose? I look forward to our conversation. Thank you both so much. Uh, as we were talking about before, these, these are uh, truly vast topics and, and ones that, that uh, maybe more than your typical foreign policy discussion really, really touch the heart. Um, so uh, thank you for uh, those introductions. Uh, Stacy. I guess I, I want to start with you. Um, we know that a lot of work goes into public diplomacy, a phenomenal amount of work, which is now expanding to include analysis and uh, messaging, et cetera, um, and some money, not nearly as much as hard power, but um, sometimes we might get discouraged. Sometimes we might wonder, is this working? How do we know when it's working? Well, you know, I, we were just talking that I just came from Washington and we, where we had a chiefs of mission conference and we were speaking to some of some of the ambassadors who were back from around the world about different different things and uh, we were having a discussion about uh, the challenges of disinformation and uh, how it's playing out around the world. And it was a very good, meaningful one on all the, the different um, sources and uh, frustrations about beating it back and tools that competitors use and the rest of it. And um, afterwards, uh, a few of the ambassadors came up to me and said, you know, the world wants us. They want us, they want more of us, and they, um, they proceeded to give examples about, you know, what was happening in their countries and how the different things that we were doing could be done on an even larger scale and should be done on a larger scale. And that's always our challenge, isn't it, is resources and, and having enough capacity and capability to meet the demand. But um, we have an incredibly impressive track record at the same time. I mean, one in every five heads of state around the world are alumni of US government exchange programs. Um, we have something like a million alumni uh, abroad uh, currently and uh, 500,000 in the United States. And they um, are active and incredible um, allies on a, a huge range of topics. I mean, we, you mentioned climate change and what, a, what an important program uh, or what an important challenge that is for all of us. Um, right now, just my bureau, which is one part of the State Department, has something like 80 different programs that support climate change and sustainability in 100 countries. And other parts of the State Department work on this in other ways as well. Um, and we get, uh, I have like one of the best jobs in Washington because I get little kind of evidence of success messages from all around the world every day. It's like a highlight reel that's continually playing. And I, um, I, I know that people have said that after 9-11 happened, uh, some of the first world leaders to call up and offer support to the United States were alumni of US exchange programs. Um, these bonds that we make on a personal level, they just continue through a trajectory of a person's career. So programs like the International Visitor Leadership Program, um, we in embassies and consulates work sort of try to be talent spotters. And I, I think we're pretty good at it, just listening to that statistic of who goes on to be a world leader. But when they first enter our programs, they're at a much more 
junior beginning point in their careers and their lives. And the knowledge that they, that they take away and the networking that they do, both with Americans that they meet, but people from other countries who are interested in their own topics, who they study with together here mm -hmm. uh, or travel with together here. That's a lifelong connection. And we hear of networking and, uh, or um, uh, trafficking in persons networks that are broken up because of a connection between Canada and Algeria and Pakistan. And they met on a Boston program, you know, here in IVLP program originally and had knew who to call to ask this question and to follow this up and follow it up. And so it's a, it, it may seem like a trickle when you think about how big the world is, but it's a steady trickle and it's an important one because just to have these positive success stories that are sprinkled across all of the depressing news that we get and the challenges that we face it's it's very hopeful. Right, thank you. Um, for a, uh, first of all, I, I highly, highly recommend um, your book. <laughs> so um, to everyone, how we win. Um, but that was uh, framed in some ways at a different time. Um, uh, you were the first special representative uh, to Muslim communities globally. Um, and it's also a great read in terms of like how to get stuff done in a bureaucracy because you were creating um, these programs. But at that time, uh, we were all reeling, uh, you know, with uh, Charlie Hebdo and other, other attacks um, about the, the, uh, fr from the effects of violent extremism. Um, I think Americans now are acutely aware of another kind of threat uh, that may be more transnational or more even grown from within. Um, how do you look at what our actual current threats are? Have they changed that much? And, and what role um, can um, public diplomacy play in helping to address these threats? I want to say a couple of things before I answer that. The first is um, the overview of soft power, what it really is and why it's essential. Uh, eyes blaze over in Washington when you talk about soft power. You ask Stacey about measurement. You try to, go, con to go, go to Congress and ask them to give the kind of money towards soft power programs that they would look at uh, in a really deliberate and focused way uh, in other kinds of budgetary processes at the Department of Defense. It's, it's just not comparable. And while I understand that a tank or a, you know, a, a plane is a different kind of metric, uh, how many you have in your arsenal, one of the things I would ask us to do as we look at the United States today is to say, where are all the places that we can scale easily? What are the things that we can do to build a better world? Where is the capacity to surge? That capacity is with the kind of people that Stacey is talking about, the exchanges, the people that walk together on a common purpose. They may be different. They may come from different countries. They may have a different mindset, but they are attacking climate change or they're looking at fighting hate or they're pick your issue, human trafficking. They can come together. The greatest strength of the US is to be the convener and the facilitator and the intellectual partner with these kinds of networks. We can build those networks and we can expand those networks. And when you think about that power, you think about the question that you just asked. Where were we when 9-11 happened? We were, the whole world was flat-footed. We didn't expect that to happen. 93 countries lost people. It was not just the United States. It was a global event that came out of nowhere, supposedly, okay, that people, Regular people weren't thinking about terrorist organizations. However, when we thought about how do we stop this, there was one element that was all about hard power, of course, going after bin Laden, breaking down the cells, stopping the money. The other piece was how do we make sure that people are not recruited to groups like Al-Qaeda? That's the work of soft power. That's the work of ideology. When we were looking globally at the places where they were recruiting, other groups like them that were recruiting, we weren't thinking about white supremacists 
in the way we are today. Because the threat was coming from abroad. It wasn't that there weren't people in Europe or in Western, other Western nations that found that ideology appealing. We learned that the hard way with ISIS, by the way. Um, we, we made the mistake in the beginning by thinking, this can't happen here. We can't find recruitment in the United States or Canada or Europe. Couldn't happen. And then we saw 40,000 people pick up and leave and go to the so-called caliphate. Why? Because they were radicalized with the ideology of us versus them. In my view, there is no domestic and international threat. Ideology has no borders. So when you ask me the question where we are today, yeah, it's very different 20 years later. We aren't looking at AQ the way we were looking at them. We're now looking at what happened on January 6th. We're now asking questions about all these nascent groups that had been living in our country under the radar. It wasn't as though there weren't militia groups in the United States. It wasn't as though they weren't trying to figure out how to overthrow the government or make sure that whites were better than blacks or whatever they want to believe. It's just that they didn't have the organization. They didn't have the funding. They didn't have the technology to come together. All of these forces combine alongside with something that's extremely important and connected to 9-11, which is even though a group like the KKK or any other neo-Nazi group, Atomwaffen, pick your, pick your poison, they're not sitting around going, we're gonna invent something brand new. They're looking at successful models of radicalization and who was successful. ISIS was really successful. They branded themselves, they raised money, they organized themselves, they understood how to really critically go after a, the demographic that they needed. Nobody is trying to recruit people in their 80s and 90s, okay? They're looking at people under the age of 30 to be their ideological soldiers and then become their actual soldiers. So what did these white supremacist groups do? They looked at the playbook and they looked at what they have available that, to them right now. So today in America, we all see what is happening. We see the surge of these horrifying groups. We see the funding of these horrifying groups. And unfortunately, we also see the black hole that we faced after 9-11, which is this, not enough antibodies in the system to prevent people from getting radicalized. And what I would say, Mary, is that as we look at the possibilities of defense in our nation, it isn't just about building the walls around the Supreme Court. It is not just around making sure that we have enough police. It is not just about teaching parents uh, to protect their children from the shooter that, I mean, like, it's not just about that. It's also critically about soft power. It's about having people that don't look like you, pray like you, love like you, and live like you get to know each other. That's the work of the exchanges overseas. Why don't we do that kind of thing here in our country is what I'd like to know. Thank you. Uh, so Stacy, but just uh, to, to pick an element of some of the dynamics that have changed, um, the State Department in the past, um, and maybe some of its programs, uh, had the reputation of being pale, male, and Yale. Well, um, you know- and I, How are we working on that? Well, in, in truth, um, we see what we're doing in our exchange programs as providing a, a hopefully a diversity pipeline into foreign affairs careers, mm. not just in the State Department, but across the United States and government too. And I say that because we have strong partnerships with historically black colleges and universities and with um, uh, Hispanic uh, speaking, uh, Hispanic institutions historically. And we're continuing to sort of build on that. You know, we talked about in the beginning that uh, President Biden and Secretary Blinken really sees it as, as imperative to national security to, to also think about equity, inclusion, diversity, um, as part of who we need to be as a State Department and as a program. So as you know, we're, we're encouraging all of our partners, our community-based members who do our programming around to also reach out uh, in the opportunities that they give the visitors to connect with 
let, let's face it, underserved communities, communities that may not be natural affiliates from the past of thinking in terms of international affairs. And yet, you know, these are these are definitely such important parts of our own communities that we want to make sure that it's sort of inculcated at every level in our programs. Um, we have taken some very concrete steps, such as the Gilman program um, definitely recruits um, high meritorious talent from underserved communities. It's a competitive program, uh, but once you get in, um, it's it's um, it really has an emphasis on equity, and it's a fast track hiring authority into the State Department, um, as are some of the other opportunities there, so that we can make sure that we're recruiting uh, and bringing in a more diverse population. Um, and if you pay attention to say LinkedIn and you look at our recruiting efforts or the rest of it, uh, I'm amazed myself at our continuing uh, emphasis on diversity and how we have you know, the whole world reflected in our State Department, not only through the languages that they bring in, but their own cultural backgrounds and their own diversity of their experiences in neighborhoods across the country. Thank you. Uh, Farah, I uh, think I'm going to wrap up my questions with another impossible one for you, but you've been speaking very strongly. So here's, here's a strong question, um, which, which I'm exaggerating. I, I mean, we run lots of exchange programs, but um, I think uh, some people may feel, how can we, how dare we go around the world talking about how to run a democratic institution, how to have a diverse society, how to um, uh, have a, an equitable econ economy. So how dare we? Well, thank you for giving me that softball. That was really <laughs> nice of you. <clears throat> I really appreciate it. Um, look, I I'll tell you a couple of things. One is that um, the work that I began to do after 9-11 was at a really difficult time. Um, not only were we worried about another attack, um, but we were in a very unpopular war in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Um, and the work what we, the United States, was doing was, was brand new. We were going into Muslim minority communities in Europe and saying, we want to hear about your experience being Muslim in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, in Norway, when their governments weren't doing that, by the way. Um, and they were not if you looked at it on the surface, you'd say, well, there's no way America could be successful in that environment. They didn't like our president. They didn't like our wars. Um, and now America is going to come in and start talking to Muslims. You've got to be kidding me. And what happened was actually really interesting. And it's a case study to answer your question. If you are able to engage in a way that is not um, disrespectful of the culture and of the people you're talking to, if you're opening yourself up to listening and not being forceful in that our way is the only way, um, you have a better chance of opening up dialogue and building bridges. And what I received in the time that I, that I was doing this work in the Bush administration before we did this globally in the Obama administration was interesting. They couldn't understand how somebody was doing this job, first of all. Like, what do you mean the United States is sending you into Dusseldorf and into, you know, pick your place, uh, you know, in, in Europe, um, in these community centers, in these cafes, meeting with young people when our government doesn't A, know our, we exist, and B, you're building networks of Muslims around Europe? What are you talking about? Why are you doing this? Are you trying to do, are you trying to convince us that America is the greatest? And I'd say, because the guy in Oslo doesn't know the person in Sicily and you guys need to know each other because you're doing the exact same thing. We're just going to build this network and we think that you are inspirational leaders and we would like to connect you. And in doing this with a very, you're building trust, you're opening credibility. Um, you're not saying our way is the only way. It helped for, uh, for me to also be able to say, look, I grew up outside of Boston. I am an American, but I was not born in this country. I came to this country when I was a baby. I am a Muslim. I'm an American. I'm a political appointee. I'm serving my country. All of a sudden, a lot of stereotypes are, are broken down, which, is, which goes to the question you asked Stacy about the kinds of people we're sending overseas. 
we've got to show America when we're overseas. We cannot just be one element of America and we need to be honest. You cannot have a conversation if you are not credible and if, that, if you're dishonest about how you approach it. So when you ask, you know, yes, I will be really frank with you. Post 2016, it has been even harder for our co my co former colleagues at the State Department to do the work of talking about democracy and rule of law when they're looking on their smartphones at the stories that are unraveling in the United States. When we can't, the argument goes, you can't take care of your democracy in your own country and you're sitting here telling us how to do it, it is hard work. But there are principles that we believe in. The constitution is a phenomenal thing to be able to hold forward. And so it may, we not, may not be a perfect nation, but we're working towards the elements in this, in this document that says that, you know, that it's trying to build a better, a better nation and a better world. The final thing I will tell you, um, that was sort of my, my magical you know, powder that I put on when we were talking about um, the issues around Muslims and um, in the post 9-11 world. When we began to do this work, I went back and said, you know, I don't know enough about what our American presidents have said about Muslims or Islam. Because there, there are the folks outside of the United States are arguing we don't like Muslims. Al Qaeda is saying America is at war with Muslims. I need to be able to talk about my country. I have lived it. I'm part of it. I get it. But I need to have some data. I need to have some facts. And so I went back with the help of a historian to every single American president from George Washington all the way up at that time, it was Barack, at the end, Barack Obama, and said, we had evidence of every single American president talking about the, the dignity of Islam, of the importance of different religions in our country, of, of uh, building a nation in which anyone can pray on and on and on. So when you're a diplomat and you can go overseas and you can say, here is what George Washington said, here's what Reagan said, here's what Ford said, here's what Clinton said, here's what Obama said, here's what Bush said, whoever you pick, this is what they did. It changes things, finally. In the Bush administration, when I was just beginning this work and I was at the National Security Council, uh, I was in the White House library and I noticed that there were books on the shelves here in this wonderful library. It's a whole section on really old um, Bibles. There were, um, there were also very old Torahs. And I was looking at different, it was, I was obviously in the religious section didn't see any Qurans. And I thought that was really funny. And I, I mentioned it to, to my, my boss, who was Elliot Abrams, and said, um, that's really curious. I don't get it. And he looked at me and he said, so do something about it. And I wrote a note up through the system to the president that said, here we have the White House library. There are no, you, we talk about all these things. George Bush was the first president to put a Quran in the White House library. Now, why am I mentioning this? I can give you many examples of President Obama. I'm happening to give, give you this example too, where you can go back to American presidents and you can say, they're putting money where their mouth is. They're saying and walking the walk. You may believe other things, but this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to be a more perfect union. And, and when, we, when we can be fair and honest about the weaknesses that we have, and the things that we want to do, I think we're better off and are better diplomats and can do the work that needs to be done. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now we have uh, time for some questions from you. I'm wondering if the State Department is being adequately funded now. I haven't heard much of that in recent years, but several years back, there was a lot of concern that uh, musical organizations in the military okay. had more funding than the State Department. Also, Great. it was interesting, Farah, that the U.S. went into uh, foreign uh, European countries, countries it, it, Muslim population. What about going into the American Muslim uh, neighborhoods and, and, okay. and Good. Thank you. and getting so that information? Two questions, really. Um, on, on the funding question, well, the State Department is still not funded as generously as the Department of Defense. Uh, I think to no one's surprise that, that hears about that. Um, we, uh, 
we, we, we are asking for a little more money every year. Um, our administration has been very supportive of ASK. And in fact, um, Congress has been very responsive, uh, especially right now, there's a lot of emphasis, as you might imagine, on Ukraine and what's going on in that part of Europe and various ways the State Department is involved in, in both shoring up, if you will, the countries and the communities around that perimeter and providing assistance to Ukrainian uh, refugees, just as we are still very much in the business of supporting uh, uh, refugees from Afghanistan and repatriating and patriating them here in the United States and uh, taking care of them abroad and doing various other programs to, to, to stay engaged there. We are um, also looking at, you know, what they call the row, the rest of the world. And we are asking for um, support and growth in uh, all the different parts of the United uh, uh, of the world, including right now um, East Asia and the Pacific and the Pacific Islands and um, parts of the of the world that were traditionally sort of um, even more un, under under uh, under uh, appreciated. Um, so you know, we're stepping it up all over. And of course, that means a need for greater resources across the board. And that's why they're setting the strategic priorities that they are on um, looking at things like climate change and bolstering democratic values and uh, bolstering uh, economic and social opportunities and peace in WHA region so that they can help address the migrant crisis. And, you know, lots of different crises all around the world at one time. And the, the money is, is, is definitely being looked at for there and we're asking for more money. And we've been getting some very good signals from Congress about additional support. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm gonna actually interject here because Stacy can't say this, I know, but I can say, and you can too, when I go to Washington with my colleagues, I go around and knock on doors. We can do that uh, to, to get more funding. So don't forget, I know you can't say that. Really <laughs> diplomatic. I'm not gonna be diplomatic. Uh, I think we are, we are far um, less engaged with the work of soft power than we need to be. You heard me say that up front. I think Congress can do a much better job in supporting the State Department. They are not creative and innovative in the kind of money they're putting into soft power. The teams at the State Department are working really hard with the money that they have, but the ideas that they have from the work that they do already are stupendous. And I don't understand why we can't be in a place where we're giving that extra money to be able to scale things. I mean, it is, it is absurd to me. So you're being very, very nice and saying, go tell your congressman. I'm telling you, tell your congressman um, or woman. Uh, it, is, it is really a shame. The other thing I would say, just a data point for you, when we were trying to stop people from getting recruited to ISIS, do you know how much money we spent? On, I mean, I don't have to tell you, you know how much money we spend on the hard power. How much do we spend on soft power? 0.0138% of our budget went to stop people from getting radicalized. That tells you sort of the skewed perspective um, that I unfortunately I still think have, uh, is still in place. Sir, you asked a question about why we looked at Europe. We went to Europe first to pilot the idea of fighting the ideology because of the Danish cartoon crisis when everybody was surprised that something that happened in Copenhagen could have an effect on the life in Kabul. Uh, and we began to understand that there was so much we didn't understand. So the Europe Bureau under Ambassador Dan Free decided to do something really different. Um, and we started engaging. Because that program was so successful in the Obama administration, we did it globally. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel Dresner from the Fletcher School. Hi, oh, great, you Fletcher <laughs> in the house. Um, I'm struck by the, the examples you give of cultural exchange because mostly they're taking place in democracies, which certainly makes sense. It's much easier to facilitate the kind of exchange you're talking about if you're in another democracy. And the problem we have right now is that if you look at Freedom House or any other data set, there are fewer democracies out there. 
Um, and so it seems like there's a lot more parts of the world that are no-go zones for the traditional forms of diplomacy that you're talking about in terms of public diplomacy. So what I'm curious about is, to what extent is the State Department brainstorming how you can do public diplomacy in places where the government might not be terribly receptive to you? Well, you know, it's amazing, but um, many governments are receptive to programs that are going to improve their own GDP and um, quality of life in different ways. So, uh, I, you know, I, we, we, we started talking about, about Europe for a couple of reasons through there, but we are, in fact, um, active all across the globe. And um, some of the soft power that we talked about, I mean, that was one of the reasons why Secretary Blinken made that comment about culture and sports. There are, there are places where culture and sports seems like that's a, that's a safe thing. That's a popular sort of thing. Uh, we can go in there and do that. But in fact, because American values such as um, uh, gender equality and racial equity and training up leaders are, are just, you know, so much a part of every program that we do, whether it's sending an American music group abroad that has a woman as its lead singer, um, you know, across the Middle East or um, going through different uh, peace and reconciliation parts of the world that need an excuse, a reason to bring people together, such as Palestinians and Israelis, and suddenly they're doing a dance class together and it starts to build friendships and it starts to build other things. We've got lots of things going on and some of them are um, in the realm of economic development. Um, and again, some of them are in the realm of education and English language teaching and uh, bringing together people just to get soft data skills. We do very much that supports girls and women in STEM careers and giving them their first introduction to science and to having careers in that way, sometimes through programs like IVOP, but we actually start at a younger and younger level in creating these kinds of opportunities. And we have some form of that, some form of tech camp and innovation that starts again with young minds and developing critical thinking and building that into our English language teaching or in our commercial programs or, or in our literacy programs. That's, that's, all, that's all a piece of this. So we really do have things going on all around the world uh, that I could give you examples of. <laughs> could so, I, yeah, could please. First of all, um, for those of you who don't know this amazing man, um, I urge you to read his books. They're awesome and anything he reads, you should read. First, Dan Dresner. Okay, <laughs> secondly, um, but I think he asks a really important question about innovation and creativity. And that gets to my point, uh, sir, that I was talking to you about um, earlier, the, the money, I love it, I love it. You're not supposed to show people that though. This is silent, silent. Um, th so this is what I meant about, about scale. Um, there are, there is so much innovation that hasn't been realized because people have to cut their ideas short because we don't have the budgets to do it. What Dan is talking about in terms of countries that traditional models of PD don't work because we don't have that infrastructure on the ground or we see a nation that is moving in a particular way and we know there are certain things we can't do. What happens when you have new ideas about how to get to those audiences? There's no budget to make it happen. And and there's also this a question, a really real question about political will to be able to do that kind of thing. I'm very nervous about what he mentioned about the, the diminishing um, democracies on our planet. Um, and it seems to be, you know, we talk about it, but nobody's actually doing anything about it. America can actually lead in those creative efforts if we had the funding and the resources to be able to do it. Yep, thank you. I'm reading a question from Zoom from Konat O'Brien. Uh, Farah, following your comments on soft power, how can higher education institutions and administrators continue to influence the higher education system to the benefit of our global soft power? What a great question. Um, I, I, and it's perfect because we're in, we're in Boston where um, everybody should have a solution here. I, you know, one of the things that we don't teach uh, in, in high schools 
in colleges, you kind of get this if you're going to NIR grad school, is what soft power really is and all the levers that you can you can um, use in, in soft power. And I think one of the things we can do is to open up the aperture in the creativity of how we teach, what we teach, what we uh, what we open our minds to for people to understand the power that that is is uh, is activated when you are able to engage one on one on one. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is, you know, one one weak point across um, the conversation we've had today is we talk about these exchanges, but we haven't talked about the coalitions that exist across uh, higher ed and other parts of um, you know, the educational infrastructure. There's a lot going on in the United States with collaborations and coalitions. And perhaps it's time to revisit ways in which we can think about um, bringing in the toolbox of, of things that people have learned. How do you do these kinds of programs? What's a good way of doing it? You don't have to just do model UN to learn about diplomacy. There are other ways to learn about it too. So I would, I would urge us to think a little bit differently about what's offered and how we teach. Thank you. Did you want to add to that? Yeah, one other thing that I just wanted to say is that, you know, I'm talking here uh, mostly about our exchange programs, which are, created in Washington uh, with uh, in a partnership with our, a broad range of stakeholders, stakeholders who are our embassies and our consulates abroad, stakeholders who are American private sector, universities, community colleges, incubators, different groups. And we, we, we are sort of constantly innovating and in bringing those through. But I don't want to diminish the power of the people on the ground at our embassies and our missions abroad. Because when you, when you want to know about sort of individual um, innovation things, that's where it's happening. And often we, we learn what they're doing and we take it and then we do scale it. Not as much as perhaps we'd like to, but one example for that is the, um, uh, the entrepreneur uh, program that was started off for uh, the American Women's Entrepreneur Programs, which were started abroad by a mission, just like the Youth Ambassadors was started by Brazil, an idea to start connecting with a segment of society that was important and not getting the attention it deserved that grew into a greater project that was then adopted maybe by that region of the world and sometimes by the whole world. Another example is the Digital Communications Network, which began in um, Europe as a response to growing disinformation threats there. Um, and this is a community-based network that we supported and that we, we brought tools and we made connectors happen, but then it took off on its own. And now across Europe, there's a community of more than 8,000 people who are regularly in touch with each other, sort of spotting things that pop up. Did you see this? This isn't true. It's interesting. We saw that over here too, but it came over in this way and they're connecting. So we're taking that and you may have seen if you've looked at some of the recent summits that have been held, Summit of Democracies, Summit of the Americas, uh, we're now taking that into uh, Latin America and in Africa, and we're, we're sort of growing it out and scaling it out, but adapting it to exactly that part of the world and the issues that they have and they face there. So it is a sort of living, breathing organism, this idea of exchanges and pro and they're not always exchanges. There's sometimes things that we see that we want to nurture and help grow that are successful abroad and our officers and our people there are helping to make it happen. Thank you. Um, and also, you know, about I'm, I'm going to make an observation about the shrinking democratic space. Uh, this is also a really excellent time to be working with our allies. Um, you know, you may think they're all set in X or Y country, but but wow, do we need to keep our alliances strong. But there's another piece of this, which is that if you do not have relationships with civil society and connections in a time of non-crisis, what the heck are you supposed to do in a time of crisis? Mm -hmm. And the power to build that, that sort of, um, that base of resilience um, among human connections that you know somebody, uh, you have like-minded thinkers that can work on some things together will serve us really well when in fact we're faced with something as dreadful as what we've seen with, with uh, Russia, for example. 
Hello, my name is Alicia Sinclair, and I work as a contractor for Ripper, working on the Public Diplomacy Staffing Initiative. Um, my question is, when it comes to how youth across the world perceive the U.S., what do you think is more influential in shaping their perspectives? What they see our government doing here at home or okay. how our or how Americans respond to what our government does? You know, I'm not going to say that either is more important because, you know, it, a lot depends on which piece of information they're getting. Uh, what they're seeing, what they think they see government is doing and what's being interpreted to them wherever they are and what they're seeing and experiencing about what Americans are doing. Uh, I mean, I, I basically think we're a complex nation and we're you know, the best and the worst and everything in between. We're large and we're um, challenging. And, you know, that is a, a weakness and a strength at the same time. And You've, we've used words here tonight like authenticity and uh, and the fact that we have to engage in conversations about our weaknesses as well as our strengths. So, um, you know, it's it's disturbing the, the news that they get about us, about our people and our responses and and what they un understand different government officials to say. But it's it's only a piece. And most people are influenced not so much by a foreign government or a foreign talking head or official or the rest of it, but my life, who I know, the businessman who just came back from a trip, my personal experience with education or my cousins. And this is how we build these networks of trust is through this growing capability of networks of personal experiences and trust by trust by trust. And so... Could I, could I yeah, please. respond? I don't have the same view. Oh. Um, if you're talking about millennials and Gen Z and Gen Alpha, we have data that tells us a lot of things, right? Um, one of which is the algorithms are king. We see, they, they are moved by what they see when they swish their finger. Even in places where internet accessibility is rare. And I want to give you a really concrete example. And this is from a really long time ago, okay? In, um, in 2010, I was in Cambodia when I was special representative to Muslim communities. I was going to a community of Muslims that was far away from the capital. We drove into the jungle. We were there in a, we arrived at a very small village, okay? Um, very humble extremely humble. We went to a mosque that was, um, you know, wooden. We took off our shoes. We were sitting outside, very modest clothing. It wasn't very, a lot of um, glam. And I had an interpreter sitting next to me on the ground and everybody was around me as we were talking about, you know, America and all the things that you talk about when you're a foreign visitor. Um, and somebody raised their hand and they were called on and the interpreter tells me that they said, um, we watched, and I, I'm not going to mention his name and I'm curious if you remember his name. We watched blank say that he was going to burn a Quran. Does he represent America? Do you guys know who I'm talking about? Yeah, he had about 30 people in his church. What's his name? Like the whole US What's his name? They knew his name. They knew his name. And I said, I was horrified, obviously. And I said, no, he doesn't represent America. But what they saw all day on their, on their news feeds was Terry Jones was his name in, in a small congregation in Florida with 50 people, 30 people in his congregation thinking that he represents America? No. So what I would say to you is I do realize everything that you say is right about influencers and who's around you. But the problem with algorithms today is that for young people especially, they're seeing what they see and they're buying into what they buy into. I think we have a lot more to talk about. Um, however, unfortunately, um, our time uh, for this section of our discussion has come to an end. What a wonderful discussion. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you both for your work. Please join me in thanking Stacey White and Tara Pundit. <laughs>